Um, we're in James chapter 1, and we're going to finish James chapter 1 today, verses 19 through 27. Um, the title is Righteousness from a Mirror, and um, we'll get down into some of the scripture here in a little bit and, and uh, share with you the significance of that. Um, suffice it to say, James in this section is going to point us to a, a critical aspect of being a Christian, and that is reading our Bible, and what we do with the Word of God when we're reading it. There was a New England teacher in a prominent public school that was teaching a class called Bible as Literature, and the students in her class were all college-bound juniors and seniors, and many of them were honor students. But before kicking off this class, uh, the teacher quickly polled the class to kind of determine how literate in the Bible they were, kind of where they were. And here are some of the answers from that poll. Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers. Jezebel was Ahab's donkey. The four horsemen appeared on the Acropolis. The New Testament Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. Eve was created from an apple. Jesus was baptized by Moses. And the grand finale answer to the question, what was Golgotha, came back with this answer. Golgotha was the name of the giant that slew the apostle David. <laughs> and so you see, it's not uncommon that people may say that they're Christians and may say that they know their Bibles, but they don't. As a matter of fact, a recent Gallup poll showed that 82% 82, 82 of Americans believe the Bible is either the literal or the inspired word of God. And more than half of them say they read their Bibles at least monthly, at least once a month. Yet half of them couldn't answer uh, the question, name the four Gospels for me. They, they couldn't even call out the names of the four Gospels. And even fewer of them knew who delivered the Sermon on the Mount, as an example. According to the Barna Research Group, among born-again Christians, this is born-again Christians, only 18%, that's like, like a little less than 2 out of 10 people who say that they're Christians, read their Bible every day. And worse than that, only 23%, that's almost 1 in 4 people, say they have never read their word of God that they have with them. The Bible is available in more than 1,800 languages, I found out this week, and that's a lot of Bibles scattered out throughout the globe. And one person made a comment that was along these lines, that if all of the Christians who were neglecting their Bibles would pick them up and dust them off all at the same time, we would have, uh, the, in essence, the, the experience of a total eclipse, all the dust that would rise because of so many Bibles that have been neglected. So in this next section of Scripture, in the last part of chapter 1 of the book of James, James is going to take us through basically a five-step process that will speak to our reading and hearing and understanding the Word of God. So let's look at this Scripture text. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And then verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father 
is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the word. So the first of these five steps that James kind of calls out for us is the step of preparation. We have to prepare to hear and to read and to study God's word. He gives us basically four directives in this step of preparation. In verse 19, he says, be quick to listen or swift to listen. This is very important in James's day. People would come to a place of gathering and they wouldn't have Bibles. They didn't, wouldn't have this, the Old Testament scriptures on a scroll. They wouldn't have a bulletin with notes in it or anything like that. They would show up and be uh, uh, of an expectant heart and mind to hear somebody who does have a copy of the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, to read them. And so James says, more than anything, I want you to really quickly hone in and listen to what they're saying. Give them your full attention, full attention on the word of God that they're going to be reading. So if a person came in and they were not quick to listen, if they weren't listening to what was being read and what was going on, then they'd get lost. They wouldn't realize really what's going on. You're kind of left behind, so to speak. So he said, be quick to listen. The second thing that he said is to control your tongue. And it's most likely that James was referencing the church services of the day. You see, they were somewhat unstructured <clears throat> in the way that the, the service flowed. Someone would stand and they would sing a hymn, and then somebody else would get up and, and they would read an Old Testament passage from a scroll, and then someone else might stand and expound on what they just read. <clears throat> and so there were people, though, in those days that would try to dominate the service. You know, you've met the type. They think that they're really smart, and they think they really have a lot to say, and so some of these people would stand up, and they would just wax eloquently for long periods of time to try to show everybody else how smart they were. And so James is probably referencing this and saying basically, look, don't try to dominate the service. If you've got something to say, say it. But otherwise, bridle your tongue, control your tongue. In other words, be quick to listen and slow to speak. So he's telling us that we need to be able to control our tongues and be careful and very deliberate with our words. The next thing is to control your anger, he said. In the same verse, he says, be slow to anger. And so you might be sitting there thinking, well, what does this have to really do with what's going on? And again, he's probably referencing people in the services of his day. You know, if somebody got up and they were going to expound on a piece of Scripture or something and they just gave their opinions about things, well, there were people who were coming into churches back then that were trying to bring back in Judaism and other kinds of things which didn't belong there. And so someone's opinion may differ greatly from your opinion. And <clears throat> if by chance they were recognized for their opinion and you were not, then chances are you, you would have a little bit of a rub against that person. You might even get angry at that person. There may be even an angry discourse of words uh, back and forth, tension in the room, so to speak. And so James is saying, look, don't do this. Don't, don't get angry with each other. Be slow to anger. And the word there that, that he uses or the phrase that is interpreted there is an ongoing attitude of bitterness and dislike is what he means. So I would assume that he was, again, referencing the church services of that day and people would get angry with each other and they would leave and then come back the next time still angry, carrying a, a grudge, you know. And here's the thing about that. If you're carrying a grudge, if you're angry and you come into this service and you're sitting there and in this anger and this bitterness is just going round and round and round and round in your own mind, you're not going to hear a word that I say. You're not going to get it. So that's why he says be quick to listen and be slow to speak and slow to anger. And then lastly, in verse 21, he says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So this fourth directive is to remove any filthiness from your life in order to hear and understand and apply 
God's word to your life. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. You would think that filthiness meant something else than what the word really means here. The word actually translated means earwax. Earwax. Okay, so if you have a lot of earwax built up in your ear, what happens? You can't hear, right? And so he's saying, don't let the earwax build up in your ears so you won't be able to hear at all. Remove the earwax. Remove the filthiness so that you can hear and understand the word of God. That's what filthiness does. Filthiness keeps us from really latching on to the word of God because something else is controlling our mind. Something else is filling our mind when we should be filling our mind with the word of God. So to recap quickly, those directives, if you want to, to really, really capture the word of God in your life, then you have to be willing to listen or to read and concentrate on it. You have to be willing to resolve your anger and you have to be willing to look at where you are spiritually yourself. That's the first step of the five. Preparation. The second one is examination. Preparation and then examination. In the B part of verse 21, he said, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So the word here for received in the New Testament really actually means welcome. It, it means, it means uh, to have a want for something and a desire for something, to welcome it. So instead of just reading through things very quickly, we're supposed to be excited about it. We're supposed to have an anticipation about reading the word and welcoming the word into our hearts. You know, and I wonder how many people today are scattered around the globe in churches that are listening to a, a, a pastor who preaches expositorily go through the Bible and go through the Bible book by book and, and word for word and line for line and phrase for phrase, and they're not really hearing anything that's going on. Maybe they're there just because uh, of, of an obligation that they have for somebody, or maybe they just feel like that that's what they're supposed to be doing, but they're really not listening and, and uh, taking in the word of God. So James says, teach yourself how to anticipate reading the word of God. I think it's a matter of the heart. I really do. I think that as a person tries their best to get closer and closer and closer to God, that they're going to consume more and more and more of his word. So the third thing is application. We had preparation, examination, and then application. And this is kind of where the bulk of James's message in this section comes from. Uh, verses 22 through 24 said, but, he, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget, forgets what he was like. So the word for hearers here is, is like our word auditor. You, you know, if you audit a college class, you know what I'm talking about? If you audit a college class, you, you go and you listen to the professor talk, but you really don't participate in the class. You're not doing it for a grade, so you don't take any of the tests or any of that kind of thing. You just go and you listen to what the professor has to say without really being actually uh, participating in the class very much. And so this word means not to audit the word of God, not to be somebody who just kind of goes through the word of God very quickly, but invest in it, be involved in it, get involved in it to the place that whenever it says do something, then that's what you go do. And if you'll do this, your relationship with the Lord will mature. I promise it will. You'll begin to follow God's heart and his will for you in, in your life and the footsteps of Jesus will lead you through your life. But you can only do that if you're diligent in the word. Now, James has basically two approaches in verses 23 and 24 for application. The first one is kind of a, it's kind of a casual approach, and the second one is more of a deliberate approach. Once again, let me read that, 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who likes who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So in order to really kind of 
put some meat on, on this particular verse. Let me explain to you that they didn't have mirrors like we have. They didn't have mirrors with glass on them and very shiny, reflective uh, uh, surfaces on them so that they could just hold one and look at it. Typically, what they had was a piece of metal that was just very highly polished. And so they would lay it on a table and then they would get over the mirror and find a reflection, you know, and, and try to make heads and tails out of what they were looking at. So James says here that casually people look at a mirror, and they don't really pay any attention to what they're looking at, and they walk off, and immediately they forget what they saw. And a casual approach to the Word of God is this, reading through the Word of God or listening to somebody preach it, and you're not really involved, you're not really participating in what's going on, and then you walk outside the door and you forget exactly what was being read. That's the casual approach, and James says, no, don't do that. The more deliberate approach is in verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So the casual hearer of the word just kind of would glance through it and then go on and forget about it, but the true hearer of the word is deliberate, and intently they look at what, what the reflection is showing them, and they try to figure out every nuance of that reflection in the mirror. And they, they do it so much that then whenever they turn around and walk off, they are able to process exactly what they were looking at. So the more deliberate person with the Word of God would, would be involved and would uh, participate in the Word as the, the person standing behind the pulpit would carry them through it. They would get involved. They would mark where they are in their Bible and go home and sometime during the week pull that back out and read through it again and try to figure out what God's Word is saying. Uh, to the point, and, and I used this reference um, Wednesday night in our, in our Bible study, if, if I were having to be gone a lot, away from the house, on the road, and Diane wrote me a love letter, I would take that thing and I would read it, you know, three or four times before I even got out of the driveway probably. I would take it and I would tear it apart word for word and then phrase for phrase. I'd read between the lines and between the margins. I, I would basically have the thing memorized and I would be, be basically trying to glean out of that how much she really loves me. And that's kind of what we need to do with the word of God. We need to go through it word for word and phrase for phrase and line upon line and dive into it and try to figure out what it is that God is saying to us in the word that we read. So James has shared the steps of preparation, examination, application, and the next step is meditation. In verse 25 it says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Who looks at it, in a mature fashion and perseveres. So James is saying we're, con we're supposed to continue, continue, be constant in going through and reading this word and trying to figure out what in this word God really is wanting us to glean and, and to understand. And, and if you remember back in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, we just, just went through the book of Joshua, and over in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, we're told that meditation in the Word of God is the key to success and prosperity and blessing. Meditation. Now, a lot of people will tell you whenever you go and want to meditate on something that you're supposed to empty your mind and you're supposed to find this quiet place. You know, well, what is your quiet place? And a lot of people say, oh, it's on the beach. My quiet place is not on the beach. My quiet place is out in the woods somewhere on a mountaintop, hugging a big tree. No, I'm just kidding. But this is not what James is talking about. The Christian doesn't meditate by emptying their mind. The Christian meditates by filling their mind with the Word of God. That is tremendous. That is tremendous. And, and if you do that and if you can kind of constantly do that throughout the day and have the word of God just penetrating in your mind 
then it will make a difference in your life. It will help you be successful at approaching the harshness of the day. And then number five, step number five is demonstration. So we have preparation, examination, application, and meditation. The fifth one is demonstration. Uh, He concludes this section in chapter one by giving three concrete examples of behaviors that come out of a life of a person who takes God's word seriously. And the first one is is a test of self-control. In verse 26, it says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And so James is saying here, look, if you are a mature Christian, then you will be able to control your tongue. You know, I don't know how many of you here have ever ridden horses. Anybody here ever ridden horses? So you know what you do with, with the bridle and the bit. You tell that horse where to go and when to stop. And the, the, the scripture here, the verse here, I think James is basically saying, do the same thing. Bridle your tongue and guide it where to go and when to shut up. You know, and if they can't, if, that, if a person can't stop their tongue, then they're deceiving themselves because their tongue is in control of their lives. And, and James says their religion is worthless. The second one is, is one of compassion. It's a test of spiritual compassion. In the first part of verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So, taking to heart those that are around you that can't take care of themselves, the needy, is what is called pure religion, undefiled religion. And you can only imagine the, con- the conditions that the widows and the orphans lived under in this day and age in the Bible times of James. Because there were no agencies. There weren't people that, that, you know, were paid to come by and check on them. There wasn't any place that they could go really to get free food. They were pretty much having to fend for themselves. And so James is saying, no, we need to go out and we need to take care of these people who can't take care of themselves. And so you find people like that aligning themselves with Christian brothers and sisters. And that, that's the way it's supposed to be. And then finally, the last test is test of social corruption. In the second part of verse 27, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, here's the thing. We have to be in this world. We can't, we can't live in this day and age without having to deal with the world, with the world around us. But it doesn't mean that we have to allow that culture to, to lead us. We, you've heard it so many times, you have to be in the world but not of it. You have to be bold enough to stand firm on what you know is God's truth, expressing in a, in a fashion that someone can understand what God's truth is in a matter. And, and pointing them to that word in the Bible, and you can't do that unless you read your Bible. That's the only way we'll be able to ever impact the world around us. It's for us to live out every day our Christian life as we walk with Jesus. So when we come to the hearing and reading of the word of God with the the heart that is prepared with careful examination of the truth, with a determined application to its message, and with a desire to meditate upon it and let it fill our minds and our hearts, then something dramatic will happen to you and to this church. And that is, we'll be changed. We'll be changed. The more that we do this, the more that we implement 
What James is talking about here, the closer we will walk with Christ and the more we'll be changed. If you remember, Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 and 46, he was talking about, he was talking about people feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting the sick and taking in strangers and doing all kinds of things like that. And they were like, well, we, we never did that to you. And he said, no, it, if you do this to any of these, it's as if you had done it unto me. So going out and helping those that are in need and visiting the sick and those kinds of things is as if we're ministering to Christ himself. That is the display of real religion. I'm going to ask George to come on back up and we'll close. That is real religion. Some people seem to get um, sideways just a little bit with regard to religion, I think. They look at it as something that happens once or twice a week whenever they come to this church building. They view religion as some kind of experience that they had on Sunday morning. And if the worship music is really good and the worship leader is the lead worshiper and leading people and, and people raise their hands and, and those kinds of things, then they feel good about their religious experience. But if it's not that, if it's not an overwhelming experience, then they're like, well, that wasn't anything special. But let me tell you really and truly what is special. Special is coming to church knowing that God is is watching special is opening your heart and your mind to the presence of the Holy Spirit and worshiping in spirit and in truth special is loving those around you and praying for them as they need help help them special is doing that every day not just on Sunday all day not just on Sunday morning while you're at church that's special. And so today, if you heard anything that I said, you should leave this place saying, I was in the presence of the Holy Spirit who moved upon my heart. I heard a few things that Pastor Tim said that made sense to me, and I'm going to try to apply them to my life. That's what we need to do. Let's bow our heads. We'll pray. Father God, thank you for this message, such a simple message that James has brought to us as we close out chapter 1. But it's a very vital message, Father, and I pray that, that we would not let this world around us and the culture around us circumvent our display of a Christian walk as we lean on the truth and I pray, Father, that as we leave this place today that we have a desire this afternoon and tomorrow and the next day and the next day to get into your word, to find out what your word says, to understand it, to look at it as if it were a love letter from you to us, to just basically consume every word that we may mature in our walk with you, that we may see your great and mighty hand in our lives, that we may communicate with you more freely, more easily on a daily basis and that we may walk in your will. So, Father God, I just love you and I thank you right now for this opportunity that you've given me to stand before your people and to speak. I know that, that Satan doesn't like it whenever we speak the truth. I know that there are many things happening right now in the heavenly realms and I pray, Father, uh, that you would just bind Satan, that you would... Uh, not allow him or any of his cronies to come against us this day, but give us a day that is 
filled with joy and happiness as we commune with you and with each other. We love you, Father. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, right now, amen.